name is John Teague. I'm one of the pastors here, and if we have not met, I hope we get a chance to meet soon. I want to begin with a comment and a question. I used to listen to the radio with my dad growing up. We'd listen to ball calls and the kickoff call-in show before Tennessee football games, and these guys would always call in. They'd be like, hey, coach, you know, or whatever. I, got a, I got a comment and a question. And the comment is, go Vols, and my question is, you know, the comment was always, go Vols. It was like, you know, go Big Orange. My question is, what do we got to do to win today? You know, or something like that. And so I was just thinking, I, I got to start with a comment and a question. And, and my comment is this, God is on the move. Or if you like C.S. Lewis in the Chronicles of Narnia, Aslan is on the move. God is on the move. And my question is, do you see it? Do you sense it? Are you experiencing it? Or do you want it? I say that God is on the move because last Sunday through nothing other than the movement of the Holy Spirit interrupting our plan, literally interrupting the last song, if you were here last Sunday, the Holy Spirit interrupted us. Chris got up here and we were just invited to leave the comfort of our rows and dozens of you came forward and you got down on your knees on this hard gymnasium floor and you cried out for your loved ones, for your friends, your neighbors, your coworkers, that, that they would come to know Jesus as the way and the truth and the life. It was a powerful, beautiful moment. I actually had someone stop me and ask me about it in the community this week. And I was like, what? How did you know? Someone posted a picture of it and they were like, what was that all about? I was like, that was cool. That was God. I say that God is on the move because just this past week I've had several conversations. One friend is realizing, or we would say awakening to this reality that God is calling her to more. I had a conversation this week with a friend who's having dreams, like real dreams at night about something that God is calling him to step into and do. I've had people call me about their kids asking questions about getting baptized. Last Sunday night at the office at our Discover class, we had 21 people there exploring the question, where do I fit in with what God is doing here? So I say, God is on the move. And that's where you say amen. Last week, our staff got away for about 28 hours to this short worship and prayer retreat up in Knoxville. And God was speaking to each one of us in some really sweet ways. And as we carved out that time to get away to be with him, he was reminding us that he knows us by name. And I, I remind you this morning, he knows you by name. And he was speaking to each one of us individually about things that only he could know. Things that he knows we're wrestling with or that we're afraid of. Speaking words that we needed to hear. And I invited a few of you to be praying about that time for the staff as we got away. And uh, one person actually followed up with me while I was there. And it's like, how's it going? And I I sort of shot up a quick prayer to the Lord. I was like, I don't even know how to respond. How, what do I say to this person about what it is you're doing? And, and this verse came into my mind. It's Isaiah 61, verse 11. I'll put it on the screen for you. It says, For as the earth brings forth its sprouts, and as a garden causes what is sown in it to sprout up, so the Lord God will cause righteousness and praise to sprout up before all the nations. I don't know if I'd ever read that verse. If I had, it hadn't really stuck out to me, but this time it resonated in my heart. This is what God is doing. I mean, we see it all around. It's just physically, it's spring. Things are budding. They're coming to life. They're bursting with color and blooms. But he's doing something spiritually too. So I ask, is this happening in your life? Or do you want it to? And I ask because the words of Jesus that we're going to look at today, they're going to speak right into this, and I want us to be listening. We've been talking about the seven I am statements in the Gospel of John. Jesus has been revealing his character and his calling and 
his purpose through these statements. Last week, Chris looked at Jesus' claim to be the way, the truth, the life. And today we're gonna continue those themes of truth and life as we look at John chapter 15. If you wanna go ahead and pull out your Bible or your smartphone or something, if you wanna dial that up so you can follow along, I recommend that. We'll have the verses on the screen if you don't have something to follow along with. But before we read this whole passage together, I, I want to set some context. We need to understand what's happening. Jesus is having a conversation with his closest disciples, his closest followers. These were his friends. And this wasn't just any conversation. These were his final words. I mean, the, Jesus is in his final hours of life on this earth. In John chapter 13, they had had their last supper together. And that's the scene, if you remember, if you've been around church, where Jesus got up from the table and he put a towel around his waist. He got down on his knees and he began to wash the disciples' feet. It's a beautiful picture. And he challenged them to do the same for one another. At some point in the evening, they got up and they left the upper room where they had had that meal. I actually have a picture of that, a map. If you can see, I know that's small, but there's a red circle there and it's circling the upper room there in Jerusalem. The, they would have left the upper room and followed that arrow out the, the city walls of Jerusalem, out across the Kidron Valley as you head up the map there and then across the valley to the Garden of Gethsemane. Perhaps you remember that that is where Jesus would pray so intensely that he would sweat drops of blood. He knows what is coming for him and he knows what he must do. And that's where he will be arrested on the night of this conversation, which probably happened on the way to the garden. John 15, verse one, Jesus says this, I am the true vine, and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. Already you're clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. Excuse me. I am the vine and you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers. And the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire and burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. By this, my father is glorified that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. As my Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be full. So in this metaphor that Jesus is laying out for his disciples, he's talking about a vineyard and a grapevine and He's going to identify himself and his father and his followers. And he starts out by saying, I am the true vine. Now, this would have been a familiar picture for these guys and for most Jews. I mean, we see a lot of agricultural metaphors in the scriptures. It's one of the beautiful ways that God reveals himself and, and how we relate to him. But this one was especially significant because all throughout the Old Testament, God's chosen people, the nation of Israel, was referred to as a vine. There's actually songs about it. Psalm 80 talks about this. Isaiah 5 and 27, it's mentioned in Hosea and Jeremiah. Basically, all throughout the Old Testament. And whenever Israel was the vine, it was always accompanied with this other declaration that they were a vine that did not bear good fruit and therefore the wrath of God was coming. When you heard vine terminology in the first century, if you were a Jew, it almost always was a pronouncement of judgment. And yet Jesus here is turning this on its head. He says, I am the true vine. In other words, 
I'm going to do what you cannot do. And I'm going to be what you could not be. Which is nothing short of a gospel declaration, right? Jesus is saying that what has been a banner of failure over their lives, he's now going to remove and say, I've got this. I'm the true vine. You've not been able to be fruitful in a way that pleases God, but I've got this now. I am the true vine. He's taking this imagery of judgment and failure and this imagery of no matter how hard you work or no matter how hard you try, you always fall short. And he's saying, I'm going to give you a new way. I'm actually going to make it possible. And then he includes his father in the metaphor. He says, my father, the father, is the vine dresser. And the vine dresser has two roles in this metaphor. In verse two, he says, every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. So the vine dresser, God the father, removes branches that don't bear fruit. And he prunes back the branches that are bearing fruit. Now, we need to stop right here because Jesus is talking about two different types of people. In verse five, he says, I'm the vine, you're the branches. So these branches are people. And he says something interesting. I don't know if you caught it, but, but it might have raised a question in your mind. It has certainly raised questions in readers' minds over the history of the church. And the question is this, do these branches that don't bear fruit represent Christians who lose their salvation? Jesus said, every branch in me that does not bear fruit is taken away. In verse six, he says, those branches are gathered up and they're thrown into the fire and burned, which is a reference to eternal punishment. So can you, at one time be in Jesus and then blow it. Stop bearing fruit and be cut off. Well, there are people who have taken this verse and they've built an entire belief system around the idea that if you're not careful, you can and will lose your salvation. You can and you will lose your place in him. But... Before we draw that conclusion, we should look at the other things that Jesus says. We should always use Scripture to help us interpret Scripture, and we should always use context. So that's what we're going to do here. First, Jesus has already said in John chapter 6, just a few pages before, in John 6, 37, 39, and 40, he said, All that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me, I will never come cast out. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that has been given to me, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him shall have eternal life. Who was that? Everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life. Anyone who comes to me, I will never cast out. Jesus saying, I will lose no one. I will lose no one. Or to use a different metaphor, Jesus said in John chapter 10, verse 27, my sheep, they hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they will never perish and no one will snatch them out of my hand. No one will snatch them out of my hand. These are strong statements Jesus is making so that you and I would believe and trust in him for our eternal security. But it still begs the question, who are these branches that don't bear fruit? Well, the key to realize is that in John's gospel, there are believers who are not true believers. There are disciples who are not true disciples. Like the air quotes there. My daughter's been using air quotes. Like 
a little bit out of context, but the other day she was like, yeah, my friend Samantha. And I was like, is that not her real name? <laughs> anyway, listen to what Jesus says in John 8, 30. As Jesus was saying these things, many believed in him. Verse 31, so Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in him, if you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples. So these folks had believed in him. And now we're going one step further. It's like, to those who believe, if you abide in my word, then you are truly my disciples. And then six verses later to these believers, he says this, I know your offspring of Abraham, and yet you seek to kill me because my word finds no place in you. That escalated quickly, didn't it? There were these believers who now want to kill him. We see it in those who were called disciples. In John chapter 6, Jesus had fed the 5,000 miraculously, and people just were like, whoa, and they kept coming back. There were people that were following him everywhere. He's starting to teach them more about himself, and he says some really hard things like, hey, my body is the true bread. My blood is the true drink, and you got to eat my flesh and drink my blood if you want to have eternal life. And they're like, what? What? They're scratching their heads. They're saying, this is a hard thing saying, and then John records in verse 66, after this, many of his disciples turned back and they no longer walked with him. That's that same word, disciples, mathetes, disciple. Jesus used it, same place, John 6, John 8. But the best example of this is probably Judas, right? He was one of the closest disciples. I mean, he was certainly attached to Jesus in some way. He had been following along. He'd been there since Jesus had called the 12. He was one of them. I mean, he had listened to Jesus' teaching. He had gone and participated on all the field trips that they had gone on. And they were practicing all the things that Jesus was teaching. And yet, there in John 6, John sort of heals off and sort of parenthetically says, Jesus already knows that there are some who believe in him that don't believe in him. And then in John 13, as they get up from that scene at the foot washing and the meal, Judas slips out the door into the night to sell out Jesus because Judas was not a true disciple. So, can a person become a child of God and then be abandoned? Can one of Jesus' sheep be snatched out of his hand? Can a disciple be a true disciple and then not a disciple? Well, from these texts and from the Lord's words, we can say no. The branches that are broken off and later burned are the so-called believers in John 6. They're the false disciples of John 8. They're the Judas of John 13. And here's why I wanted to spend time on that. One, so that we would never fear that we could do anything to jeopardize the salvation that we couldn't do anything to earn. Thank you. That's significant. I felt like more significant than your response was to me. So I'm going to say it again. The reason we would need to look at this is so that we will never fear that we could do anything to put in jeopardy the salvation we did nothing to earn. Yeah. Yeah. That's the beauty of the gospel. It's the grace of God. We did nothing to earn it. He gives it to us. Why would we think we could then take it and throw it away? Jesus says, no one will snatch them out of my hand. I will lose none of them. But here's the other reason why we need to understand this. Because there are many who will attach themselves to Jesus in some way. Maybe to Jesus, maybe to a church. Maybe they'll publicly acknowledge his name and give him credit for their championship season. You know, maybe, maybe they'll come and they'll attend gatherings like this but they're not truly believers. I had an old pastor 
of mine would say that, you know, sitting in church doesn't make you a Christian any more than sitting in a garage makes you a car. There's a change of nature that has to happen. There's, there's this, this thing that has to happen in our hearts by the power and work of the Holy Spirit where, where we, we realize, we awaken to the fact that we need a Savior, that we're broken and sinful, and we, we confess that sin, and we trade it in, and we, instead of our sin, we get Jesus' his righteousness. His death pays the penalty for our sin, and now the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, that we become a new creation. Our nature is changed. But just coming to church won't do that. And it would be the most unloving thing to let anyone have false hope in some religious activity, some attendance of a service here and there, perhaps on Easter, without truly having their their hearts transformed. It's not a matter of just verbally attaching yourself to Jesus. It's surrendering your life to him. And that's important. So how do we tell the true believers from the false? Well, Jesus says it in John 15, 8. He says, by this is my father glorified, that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. Now, all throughout this passage, in 11 verses, Jesus uses the word abide and fruit. He uses the word abide 10 times. He uses the word fruit six times. So I think we can, we can deduce from this that true disciples abide and bear fruit. What does that word abide mean? Because that is not a word we use very often. Well, it's the Greek verb meno. It just means literally to stay, remain. Jesus is inviting these guys to stay. And at this point, there's already one that has left. He's saying, if you stay connected to me, you're going to experience my love. You're going to bear fruit. You're going to prove to be true disciples. You're going to have fullness of joy. But he said in verse 5 that apart from me, you can do nothing. And Jesus knows as he's talking to these guys that it's about to get real. It's about to get hard. They're on their way to the garden. They're going to fall asleep when they should have been praying. Jesus is going to get arrested. Peter's going to pull his sword out. He's going to chop a guy's ear off, just sort of out of a a gut instinct reaction. And then they're all going to run and hide. And Peter's actually going to deny Jesus three times, just like Jesus said he would. Jesus is saying, guys, stay. Remain with me. And he says this in verse five. He says, stay in me or abide in me and I stay in you. I abide in you. Those three words, I in him. Beautiful declaration of the gospel talking about the living God coming and taking up residence inside of us. The triune God, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, the the God of the universe lives inside those who are believers. That's incredible. That's the miracle of the gospel. We are united with him. That's why the Bible over and over and over again says these prepositions like with him and in in him. Paul would say in Colossians 1.27, this is a profound mystery of the gospel. Christ in you, the hope of glory. He is in you. And he's going to stay in you. He's going to abide. He's going to dwell in you. And your life is going to bear fruit because of that. I used to tell my students the story about the little boy who heard the pastor talking about how he needed to ask Jesus to come into his heart. And so he he went down at the end of the service to speak with the pastor, but he had this kind of grim, like confused look on his face. And the pastor got down and he's like, are you you ready to ask Jesus into your heart? And he says, well, yeah, I really want to, but, but 
I'm so little and he's so big. Won't he stick out? And the pastor just said, yes, he will. That's the point. Absolutely, Jesus will stick out all over the place when you ask him to come in to your heart. The fruit that Jesus is talking about here, it's his character. As we remain connected to the vine, his life and his power flow through us and that changes us and we begin to look more and more like him. The apostle Paul would talk about it like this in Galatians 5, this might be familiar. He says the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Jesus was all of these things perfectly. And as we stay close to him, as we abide in him and his words abide in us, we start to bear that fruit in our lives. So it begs the question, what does abiding look like? Like, how do we do that? And I think the apostle Paul can actually help us in his letter to the Colossians. In Colossians chapter one, he's praying for the believers in Christ in Colossae. So they they are united with him. These are true believers. They are in Christ. And then he prays this incredible prayer for them that I think really helps us out. Colossians 1, verse 9. He says, and so from the day that we heard, he's talking about the, the day they heard about the faith of the Colossians, putting their trust in Jesus. We have not ceased to pray for you asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. That's an incredible prayer. Let me illustrate what I, what I think Paul is showing us about how to abide and bear fruit. Paul's praying for these believers, first, that, that they would know, that they would know God, that they would be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding. And as they know that, something's going to happen. They're going to walk in a manner that's worthy of him. They're going to obey him. His words are going to abide, as Jesus would say. And then as they do that, as they say yes to him, What happens? They're going to bear fruit in every good work, which has always been the plan since the very beginning. In Ephesians 2, Paul says, by grace you have been saved through faith. It wasn't anything that you did. But then verse 10 says that we're saved by grace through faith so that we could walk out the good works that God has prepared for us. So as we know about him and we begin to walk this out and say yes to him, we begin to bear fruit. And then Paul says that now we're going to increase or we're going to grow some more. And now we're going to grow more in our knowledge of him, which is going to lead to more obedience as we trust him in new areas of our lives, like our relationships or our career or the decision-making process for something important in our lives. Perhaps it's our finances or you, you fill in the blank as we continue to grow in our knowledge of his will, we begin to obey in new ways and that bears new fruit, which means we continue to grow. And as we continue to do this, and as we continue to walk this process out, we get stronger and stronger and stronger. And we begin to look like this this old tree the rings of aging and growing and developing roots that go deep into the ground and and get stronger and bear more and more fruit. I love that picture. That's what we all want. That's how we want to grow and abide and bear fruit. Jesus says, that's going to prove that you're my disciples. Paul says it's going to strengthen you with all power. It's going to give you endurance and patience and joy. This is what Jesus is talking about. Back to John 15. In verse 8, Jesus says this is how 
my Father is glorified. So the result of this process is that God gets glory. And then he says, and you're going to prove that you are my disciples. See, this process right here does not make you a follower, does not make you a disciple. It proves that you are. It proves that you are. And then third, Jesus says that all of this is going to produce the fullness of joy. That's his joy that will be in you. And that's a joy that cannot be stolen by any thief. It cannot be swept away by any storm. It cannot be overcome by any attack. So what? What does this mean for us today? Well, in 2007, Katie and I were invited out to San Francisco with some friends. And while we were out there, we went to the, the UT Cal game in Berkeley. And then we got to go drive up into wine country, up into Napa and Sonoma. Just beautiful, just rows and rows and rows of these incredible vineyards and these vines and, and these, these incredible grapes that they produce up there. And a couple things stuck out to me. One, when you go visit a vineyard and you meet the master vintner or perhaps the owner of the vineyard, they don't take you into an office and give you a presentation about their business and about their vineyard. They bring you out into the rows and they show you the vines and the branches and they reach in and they, and they pull out the fruit and they show you. They show you what has been produced by all their their time and their labor and their investment. And they let you taste it. And it's incredible. You know, Jesus says that God is that master vintner. He's the vine dresser. Loves to show off and be proud of his fruit. But you know, those vines and those branches don't just grow wild on their own. That, that vintner or that vine dresser has been working hard shaping those things, pruning those things. And this morning I was thinking about that, about this image of, of God, his pruning work in our lives. And, and we could hear that and just think that, 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 that God just wants to just go hacking away at our lives because he's frustrated with us, that we're not bearing enough fruit. And so we have this picture in our mind that, that God's like, ha, 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 ha. But I don't think that's who God is. I think it's way more personal and way more gentle, way more precise as he takes the little shears and he begins to prune back places in our lives that, that maybe are starting to grow a little wild or in, a, in the wrong direction. And he wants to prune those back so they grow in the right direction and so that they will bear more fruit and that'll bring him glory and prove us to be his disciples. I think it's gentle and kind and loving not condemning. The second thing I noticed when we were up in wine country was how these vines and these branches were growing on these like cables, these like strings and these stakes. And they needed some kind of trellis, just like, you know, if you have a vine at home that you grow in your backyard, it needs some kind of trellis to grow on. It needs some kind of structure or framework. And I think that's true of us too, as Jesus talks about abiding in him and walking this out. Like we need a structure for this. We need a trellis for this. You know, we need to be in relationships that are encouraging us in this, cheering us on in this, challenging us in this. We need environments like this. We need disciplines where we carve away time to listen, to let his word abide in us and sink in and speak into those areas of our lives. We need places where we can practice saying yes to him and kind of fumble along as we do it and watch as his character starts to pop out of our lives. So here's what I wanna do in closing. I wanna invite you to bow your heads and close your eyes. I wanna ask a couple of questions. The 
the first question is this. Which kind of branch are you? If you're here this morning and you feel like the branch that is not bearing fruit because you've never fully surrendered your life to Christ, you've attached yourself to him or his name or his people sporadically throughout your life, but you haven't put a stake in the ground. You haven't, you haven't confessed your sin and received the gift of eternal life. Then if you're sensing that this morning, that's, that's evidence of the power of the Holy Spirit bringing you to that knowledge and understanding. And today you say yes. That's your response to confess your sin and say yes to Jesus and ask him to be your savior, your source of life. Or maybe you're a believer. You're a branch that has born fruit. Maybe you feel like you're not, your life, as you look at it, may not really be bearing the fruit. And God's inviting you to abide. He's inviting you to some some form of discipline or structure or environment where he can tend to your soul, give you the strength and the power to bear fruit for his glory. your joy. So maybe you just need to ask him for that. And maybe you need to ask the Lord one final question. What are you calling me to do to cultivate an environment for more growth? Because in Christ, you were given new life to bear fruit for God's glory and your joy.